As you turn your Bibles to James chapter 1, as we're going to be today, uh, you heard Valerie in the, in the video mention that they're going to be having work crews go over to start getting the shelter uh, to the place where it can be used. And they need people um, who can do uh, construction work and plumbing and electrical and things to, uh, to help with that. If you're interested at all, please come and let one of us know or Dirk know. We would love to uh, connect you maybe with one of these teams that's going to be going over to do some of this work. And um, they, need, they need the work and, and uh, maybe you have those skills skills and are able to contribute to that uh, so there can be a place for these girls to be rescued and cared for and are restored into to life and society. So uh, just be uh, processing that if you've got a skill set that maybe would lend itself well to that kind of project. James chapter 1 is where we're going to be today. And we're starting a brand new series called Faith in Real Life, going through the book of James all this fall, leading up to our holiday uh, series and as we begin this series, uh, I don't know about you, but, but it seems to me that it's been a really rough summer. And, and even more than that, a, a rough year. You think about the, the natural disasters we've recently seen take place uh, in our country and around the world. There's political upheaval, there's social conflict, racial conflict throughout our country. We just heard this week of another school shooting that took place up in Spokane, Washington, Yet another school shooting. I still remember one of the, you know, the, the Columbine and, and just the, the shock that that was. Now it just seems like, oh, here comes another one. It, it's become that regular in our, in our life and in our, our culture. I know some of you are, are dealing with, with medical issues. Some of you recently just got diagnosed with some, some devastating um, health news and, and diagnoses and some of you have experienced death of family members or loved ones or close friends. Yesterday, I attended a funeral of, of um, a fellow pastor in Dallas, the chaplain at Dallas Retirement Village, a good friend, and um, experiencing that loss, and, and his family experiencing that loss, celebrating that he's with the Lord, but, but knowing that, that he is no longer here. Life is, is hard. Life is painful. There's suffering. There, there are trials. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I, I find that it's hard to make my faith in Jesus and what I read about in Scripture relate to the, to the difficulties that I'm experiencing in everyday life. Sometimes it feels like there's, there's this spiritual and, and theological realm, theological meaning the study of God, things of God, and, and then there's everyday life, and how do you bridge the gap between the spiritual and, and the everyday life and the things that we are struggling with? Do you ever have a hard time connecting the two? Well, we're starting this series called Faith in Real Life, and one of the reasons I'm really excited about it is because the book of James is, is a book that's about living out faith in real, everyday situations. It's a book that's all about faith in Jesus in real life. And even as we start today, we're going to be talking about this, this uh, idea of suffering and trial, and, and it's something that most of us experience, and our, some of you are experiencing right now. And James is a real guy writing to real people about real problems, problems that each of us can relate to. And so there's something in the book of James for you. So I hope you stick with us through this series because there's a lot to learn about how our faith in Jesus impacts our everyday lives. As we start, we're going to read the first 11 verses of this book. And so James chapter 1, starting in verse 1, in honor of God's word, if you'd stand with me, please, this morning. Let's read together the words of James as we open this book and this study. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, without doubting, for the doubter is like the surging sea, driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded and unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of humble circumstances boast in his exaltation, but let the rich boast in his humiliation, because he will pass away like a flower of the field, 
For the sun rises and together with the scorching wind dries up the grass, its flower falls off and its beauty, beautiful appearance perishes. And in the same way, the rich person will wither away while pursuing his activities. Let's pray and we'll talk about what this says to us today. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can hear from you, that you speak into our everyday lives, the, the things that we struggle with day to day. And God, as we go through this, this book, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us, that we would better understand how to live our faith out in everyday life, in everyday situations. God, will you strengthen us? Will you challenge us? May we have our open hearts and open ears to hear what you have to say to us today. And then may we diligently apply it to our lives to become more and more like you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. In your bulletin, there is a, a handout and uh, a devotional guide that we have put together, um, and each week we'll have those in the bulletins, and um, some of it is just for you to be able on your own to dive deeper into the passage, but also some of those questions may be used in your life group. So if you're part of one of our life groups that'll be going through the sermons, then uh, make sure you study up in preparation each week for gathering with your group, and I hope you find those things helpful. The question we're going to answer today from this passage is simply this. How do you find joy in the midst of suffering? How do you find joy in the midst of suffering? As I said, James is a real guy writing to real people about real everyday situations and how faith impacts those real life everyday situations. So before we get into it, let's talk about who the author is and who he's writing to. And in verse 1, we see that uh, spelled out for us. It says, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was James? Well, James was a leader in the early church, a well-respected leader, a leader who had a great impact in some significant decisions that the early church made. In fact, just this last summer as we were going through the book of Acts, we, we talked about the Jerusalem Council and James played a pivotal part in making the decisions of the, the Jerusalem Council on how, how to handle the law and circumcision and other things. And we see through the book of Acts many people looking to James for leadership and for direction. But James was not always the well-respected church leader. When he was younger, he was uh, the doubting half-brother of Jesus. Jesus' little brother. A little brother who was embarrassed of his older brother. And in Mark chapter 3, we find this fascinating little story of, of Jesus as, as his popularity is, is surging. Jesus is trying to get away from the crowds, and so he goes up on a mountaintop to get away. But as he comes down from the mountain back, he goes to, to a home to try to eat a meal, and the crowds find him and surge after him again. And it says in Mark 3.20, that Jesus entered a house and the crowd gathered again so they were not even able to eat. Jesus was hungry. He had been hiding from the crowds. He comes simply to have a meal, but the crowds won't let him. They're surging into this house. They want a piece of Jesus. In verse 21, when his family heard this, this is including James, they set out to restrain him because they said, he's out of his mind. Can you imagine if all of a sudden your brother or sister, your sibling, was hugely popular and crowds couldn't get enough of them and they were making claims of being the promised Messiah, God in the flesh? What would you think? Well, clearly they thought he was crazy and they wanted to shush him. They wanted to, they wanted to hide him. We don't, we don't want him to, to expose himself to the world as the Messiah because we know he can't be the Messiah. This is just Jesus. He's our brother. He's our son. Let's, let's hide him and get rid of him. That was James. So how do you go from being that kind of doubting brother to being someone who declares themselves a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ? Someone who is a leader in the church that is following this Jesus. Well, we know that, that Jesus died on the cross. It was seen by, by the people in Jerusalem, including his family, they knew he was buried in a tomb, and then he rose from the grave. And it says over the period of about a month, Jesus appeared to specific groups of people. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7, we read this. Then he, Jesus, appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. 
Jesus, the one that James saw die and be buried, appears to James. And James believes. What would it take for you to believe that your brother or sister was in fact God? That's what happened to James. What would it take for you to declare your allegiance to your brother or sister? Because that's what James does in our passage. James, a servant, literally a slave of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, Master, Christ, meaning the Messiah. What would it take for you to declare your sibling was God, was your Lord and your Master? And this James, this brother of Jesus, is writing to, it says, the 12 tribes dispersed abroad. Different than the tribes described earlier in Indonesia, these were the 12 tribes of Israel. If you remember back uh, as Israel was starting as a nation, Israel started with a man, a chosen man, Abraham. God came to Abraham and promised that he would become a great nation. And Abraham had a promised son, Isaac. And Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob, the younger brother, was the chosen brother, and from Jacob came 12 sons, and those 12 sons were the forefathers of the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. And it was these 12 tribes, as they settled in the land, began to disobey the Lord, and they were continually judged. They became the whipping boy of enemy nations who would come in and judge the people for their rebellion against God. And finally, the the northern ten tribes were were destroyed by the Assyrian nation, the Assyrian empire. They were dispersed and scattered all over the empire, so they could not rise up and revolt against Assyria any longer. And then the Babylonian empire came in and destroyed the southern two tribes, and they brought them into exile. Then came the Persians, and then came the Greeks, and then came the Romans, And there was no homeland, there was no nation of Israel. The Jewish people were scattered all over the known world. And they formed these pockets, these little communities of Jews that would would live together and serve together and worship together as Jews. But James was not just writing to Jews, he was writing to Jewish Christians. Jews who had become followers of Jesus. And so not only were they hated and despised by the Romans for their Jewish heritage, but they were also being rejected by their Jewish community because they had renounced Judaism and instead were following Jesus. And so James is writing to these people who are experiencing great suffering and turmoil and trial. And he writes to them first about something that we all experience at some level. Suffering. And here's his words to these people. Verse 2, Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials. Consider it joy when you suffer. Joy and suffering are two things that we don't often put together. Telling someone that they need to have joy while they're suffering is kind of like telling your kids they need to have joy when you're taking family pictures. Kind of like this. It should be a joyful thing, right? But it just doesn't happen. You can't tell your kids to be joyful for family pictures. You can make them hold the word joy, but they're not going to be joyful, right? And you can hand someone the word joy and say, hey, you need to be this. But in the midst of suffering, many of us are like, that. that's impossible. How can I have joy in the midst of my trial, my suffering? Well, the reality is is that we don't have a choice. Regardless of how we feel, we don't have a choice. Verse 2 makes it clear. There's three important things we need to know from verse 2. First, trials are not an option. It says whenever you experience various trials. It doesn't say if you experience trials. It says when. They will come. You will suffer. That's what it means to live life in a broken world. You're going to experience suffering. Secondly, trials are not the same. They're they're universal. Everyone experiences trials, but not every trial is experienced by every person. Notice it says, whenever you experience various trials, they're going to be different. 
but we all will experience them. They may vary in intensity and what area of life they may impact, but we will all experience trials. There's not a one-size-fits-all type of trial or suffering. And so we, we need to be careful that we don't, you know, say that, that my suffering is worse than your suffering because you're suffering something different than my suffering. No, we all suffer, and we need to understand that together we need to help each other overcome the things that we are going through because we all struggle, we all suffer, we all will experience trials, trials of different kinds. And even though we're experiencing different trials, the third thing we need to see from this verse is that the response is the same. Regardless of the trial that you're going through, we are called to find joy in the midst of the suffering. And so the question that we come back to again is how do you do that? How do you find joy in the midst of of suffering. It's a command given. It's not an option. It, it's not, hey, it would be really great if you could find joy. No, it's consider it a great joy. This is a, a command given. There is no other option for the follower of Jesus. And so if there's no other option, we better figure out how to do this well. So how do we do it? Number one, by embracing endurance. By embracing endurance. Look, look at verse two again. Consider it a great joy. That's the command. My brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, we all will, different kinds, because, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And then verse 4, we see the second command given. Here it is. Let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. What we have to understand is that there is a purpose behind the trials that we experience. There's a reason for our suffering. Now that goes completely against how we feel in the midst of a trial, isn't it? Because when we're going through a trial, oftentimes, whether you say it audibly or just think it, oftentimes what we're thinking is this, why me? Right? Why me? There doesn't seem to be a purpose behind this. There doesn't seem to be a reason for why I'm going through this. Now, of course, there are times when we do something really stupid and there are consequences. That's not what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. When, when you're experiencing something and there's no rhyme or reason as for why this is taking place in your life. It just happened. And so we think, why me? What's the purpose? Why am I experiencing this? Why now? Why this? It's not fair. Have you ever been there? Let me, let me give you an example of this. It's a very, very a minor example. I wouldn't even put this in the category of a real trial or suffering, but, but I think it'll help you understand what I'm trying to describe. Um, back in the spring, my wife and I were, were getting our, our, uh, the first house we ever owned, getting it ready to sell. Um, our family had grown. We were in a different life stage, and so we wanted to get something a little different. And so we were, you know, doing what you do when you sell a house. You're getting all the projects done that you always wanted to do and never actually did, right? And so we were replacing the floors, doing paint, doing all this stuff and um, all the things that we needed to do so that it would be a presentable house and sell well. And, and of course, those things cost a lot of money and a lot of time to get done. And so we had invested, you know, months of, of you know, evenings putting, you know, doing projects and putting time in. And, and we, you know, kept having to put out money to, to get the supplies for the things that we were doing and pay for the projects that we had other people do. And so what, what we noticed was our bank account, you know, was doing this and our, our credit card balance was doing this. Have you ever been there? And then it's really, you know, it makes you kind of uh, stressed out when you see them start to reverse like that. Now we knew that at the end of the day, if we could sell the house, everything would be good. We just had to get through the sale of the house and, and then everything could get paid off. But when things are going like this, you get a little stressed out. And we were tired, we invested all this time, but we were close to the end. The light at the end of the tunnel could be seen. We knew that we almost were done with all the expenses and all the time. And then we had one of those intense spring storms. It had rained all winter and spring, but it was at that moment that all of a sudden one of our interior door frames started to drip water. And we did the, why this? Why now? Are you kidding me? Come to find out, the problem with our roof had existed since the house was built. 17 years, the roof never leaked. 
until right then when we were out of money and exhausted and invested months worth of work into this house and now one more expensive, time-consuming, stressful problem. It seemed to completely lack any sort of purpose. It almost felt like we were being punished for some reason, even though we couldn't figure out for what. It just happened. Why? We're told in our passage. Verse 3, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. God had something to teach us by causing our roof to leak right at that moment. And, and you know what? When, when your bank accounts are doing this, right? When we've invested all this time and something like that happens, you know what it causes us to do? It causes us to pray a heck of a lot more than we were praying before that. God, we need you because our, our bank account, you know, we need, I don't know how much this is going to cost and we don't know how to fix this. And God is teaching us something through the suffering, through the trial. There's a purpose behind it. And so the first command is to consider trial, suffering with joy. But the second command is embrace the endurance that this suffering is going to bring. Embrace the suffering you're going through because it's there for a reason. God is doing something through this painful experience. It's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like those of you who have ever trained for something athletic. Um, back in the, in the spring, I was training for a 5K run because we were doing our fearless 5K. And I did a program called Couch to 5K because I love sitting on the couch, and I love Ben and Jerry's, and I love Netflix, and I hate running. And so the prospect of running a five kilometer race was pretty daunting. And the reason they have couch to 5K is because if you're like me, sitting on the couch watching Netflix eating Ben and Jerry's, you can't just get up one day and decide to run a 5K. That's impossible. And so I started the training process, and it was painful. You start by walking a lot and running just a little bit, but even though you're running just a couple minutes, at the end you're like, <gasps> right? Because it's painful. My body was not conditioned for that. But then a few weeks in, the, the amount of running increased, the amount of walking decreased, but I was feeling stronger, I was feeling better, I wasn't breathing as heavy. And sure enough, by the end of it, I was able to complete a 5K race. And I felt pretty good at the end of it. Because all that, that, that pain and toil and sweat and work produced endurance. I, ha I had to let this training process have its full effect on me. I had to embrace the pain and the suffering and the toil of it. And that's what he's saying here. Look, you're going through something and that something has a purpose. It's building endurance in your life. So let endurance have its full effect. Embrace the endurance it is bringing. Because that in and of itself is leading to something. Look at this. Let the endurance have its full effect, verse 4, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. You can be complete. You can be mature. That word mature is a great word. It can be translated from the Greek as, as perfect, as finished. It makes me think of a, a woodworker who takes a hunk of wood and he, he chips away at it and carves it and, and sands it and, and smooths it out and, and puts varnish on it and then polishes it. And at the end of all this work and all this, this pain and toil and sweat, he's able to produce a finished work of art. That's what God is doing in you. I'm sure for the piece of wood, if the wood could talk, it would say that it didn't appreciate being chipped at and, and torn at and sanded and grinded and, and polished and all of these things. But at the end of the day, it's this beautiful, finished work of art. And that's what God is doing in you. But the, the tools that God uses to shape you and mature you and, and mold you and finish you, his tools are the tools of trial and suffering. Without suffering in your life, you could not be presented, finished, complete, mature, perfect. As Daniel Doriani says, writing about this passage, there is no virtue that trials cannot build. There is no defect trials cannot remedy. No strength trials cannot impart. God is doing something in and through the suffering and the trials that you are experiencing 
And this, this maturity, this completeness, this being finished and perfect, what it really means is you're becoming more and more like Jesus. So how do you find joy in the midst of suffering? You embrace the endurance. Endurance brought about by the suffering, the trial, the pain. There's a purpose behind what you're going through. And it's hard to see when you're in the moment, but God is taking you somewhere. He is, he is forming you to be someone. And he's helping you to be more and more like Jesus. Secondly, by seeking wisdom. You can have joy in the midst of suffering by seeking wisdom. Verse 5, now if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without doubting for the doubter is like the surging sea driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord being double-minded and unstable in all his ways. What is it that we need most in the midst of suffering when we're experiencing a trial? Wisdom. What is it that we're often in short supply of? Wisdom. And so while we need wisdom to be able to navigate our way through a trial, through suffering, through the situations that we face, oftentimes we don't have the wisdom we need. And so the, the command here, another command is to ask for wisdom. And notice the word play here. Verse 4 ends by saying that we are being made mature, complete. The end goal is that we lack nothing. However, verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, we're not there yet. We, we don't always have the wisdom we need. We're being led there, that's the end goal, but sometimes we, we aren't there yet and we need wisdom that we don't have. And so the command is to ask. God wants to give his people wisdom. He wants to give them guidance. He wants to lead us through. But there is a qualification given, isn't there? See, oftentimes we don't ask for wisdom because, because we think that maybe, you know, when we ask of God, that he's not going to answer what we ask for. Because we've conditioned ourselves to, to think that God doesn't answer our request when we ask for things that God never promised. See, this isn't, this isn't giving us carte blanche to ask for whatever we want, whenever we want. It's telling us that we can ask for something specific. Wisdom, guidance. But we think, well, I prayed for something else and I didn't get it. Maybe if I pray for this, I won't get it. And so we're reluctant to try. But no, this, this promise is given to us. Ask, because God wants to give us wisdom. But we are to ask in faith without doubting. And this causes us sometimes to put too much pressure on ourselves. Because we hear that word doubt, and we think that any sort of question or, or, or lack of faith means that we won't get what we're asking for. And so we do this, man, I really need wisdom from God. I really need his guidance. I'm desperate for it. So I'm going to ask and I pray and ask for wisdom, but, but I wonder if he's going to give it to me. I wonder if he can get me through. And then we think, oh no, I just, I just question whether or not he's going to get me through. Is that, is that doubting? Is that a lack of faith? Does that mean he's not going to give me what I really need, wisdom and guidance? And so we start to fall apart because we really desire guidance from God, but we question whether or not God can really help us through the situation. But we are desperate for guidance from God, but we know if we question it and don't have faith that we're not going to get it. So what am I going to do? Have you ever been there? But notice how the doubter is described. It says, let him ask in faith without doubting. This is verse 6. For the doubter is like the surging sea, driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord, be, um, being double-minded and unstable. A double-minded person. Two minds. It's, it's someone who, who is trusting both in God, but also in themselves or, or other things. And at any, any given moment, they may be trusting God, but they may be trusting themselves. And the illustration given is like the waves on a seashore. Have you ever watched the waves at the beach? Right? They, they come in and they splash up on the shore, but then they pull back out. 
And they rush upon the shore and they get pulled back out, back and forth and back and forth, a double-minded person. This is not someone who desperately needs wisdom from God and is relying on wisdom from God, but has a little question in their mind, is this really going to work? No, this is someone who has two minds. Peter Davis describes it this way. In a service of worship, this person is caught up in the music, words of praise, or the exhortation of the sermon, and trusts God completely. But outside, the same person faces the winds of adversity and instead of trusting despite feelings, gives in and believes that only his or her own resources and cleverness can help. Like wind-tossed water, an unstable Christian sways back and forth. Back and forth. On Sunday, all about the Lord. And on Monday, all about self. Sunday, trusting and praising God. Monday, trying to gut it out on their own. Back and forth. A double-minded person. So don't be double-minded. Don't worry when you have a question mark in your devotional. I bring up uh, uh, the man who came to Jesus asking for healing for his son. And Jesus says, I can heal if you have faith. And the man says, I believe. Help my unbelief. It's a person who desperately desires to believe but knows it on their own. They can't fully believe. And God honored that and Jesus healed that man's son. That's not what is being described here. We can be people who believe but ask for help when we don't believe. This is a person who is back and forth of two minds. And when it's convenient, when it's good, when it's helpful, they serve the Lord. And when it's tough, they don't. So don't be a double-minded person. How do you find joy in the midst of suffering? By embracing endurance, by seeking wisdom. And then we get another command down in verse 9, by celebrating humility. Verse 9, let the brother of humble circumstances boast in his exaltation, but let the rich boast in his humiliation. Because he will pass away like the flower of the field, for the sun rises and together with the scorching wind dries up the grass, its flower falls off, and his beautiful appearance perishes. In the same way, the rich person will wither away while pursuing his activities. Trials are humbling experiences, are they not? When we suffer, we realize that that nothing we have can make things better. And it's true for both the rich person and the poor person, for those who have a lot and for those who have nothing, for those who have a great skill set and those who don't. When we experience trial, it's God showing us that nothing that we have really can make any difference. It's bringing both the rich person and the poor person, the skilled person and the not so skilled person, the really intelligent, educated person and the one who doesn't have much education. It brings them all at the same level before Jesus. See, the reality is the haves and the have-nots are both in equal need of the cross. The haves and the have-nots are both in equal need of the cross. And suffering is a way for God to remind us of this fact. That before God, we all have nothing. Nothing of any value, of any worth to him. Because ultimately, our biggest problem is our sin, our rebellion against God. And there is nothing our wealth or our education or our smarts or cleverness or skills that can do anything about it. We are all on equal an equal playing field before a holy God. But that's the hope of the gospel. That there's nothing we can offer, but Jesus came to this earth and gave of his life, served and suffered in our place, died a death in our place so that we could be offered forgiveness, so we could have our sins washed clean. The only way our sin can be taken care of is coming before Jesus, not with an abundance, but with empty hands. And receive the gift of forgiveness and new life through Jesus' death and resurrection. And so when we suffer, it's a reminder to us to celebrate humility. It's a reminder to us of what we don't have. And that's why it says in verse 9, let the brother of humble circumstances boast in his exaltation because it's when you are at your lowest that God can raise you up. And notice what the command is given to the rich person, but let the rich boast in his humiliation. 
Don't boast in what you have and what you can do. These things are going to pass away. Instead, boast in your humiliation. That regardless of how rich or smart or educated or clever or skilled you are, that all of that ultimately means nothing. That we all are in equal need of a Savior. And everything we need has been offered to us. And so when we come in that humble state, that God can lift us up. And sometimes you and me, what we need most is to be humbled so that we can be lifted up. That's why later in the book of James, James 4.10, it says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. You try to exalt yourself, you're going to be humbled. When you come before God humbled, he is the one that can lift you up. So how do you find joy in the midst of suffering? by embracing endurance, by seeking wisdom, by celebrating humility. And so what trial are you facing today? How are you suffering? We all experience it at different levels at different times, but we all suffer. We all experience trial. And I know from from being your pastor that many of you are suffering right now. Some of you are experiencing relational trials. Husband to wife, parent to children, grandparent to grandchildren, parents of adult children, brothers to sisters, brothers to brothers, sisters to sisters. Conflict. Many of you are experiencing trials in your relationships. Many of you are experiencing trials at work. You're trying to make ends meet, but you're working for an employer that, that is asking you to compromise your convictions or, or they're asking you to work more hours that you can or should. Or it's a boss that's difficult to work for or employees that are difficult to get along with. Or maybe you, maybe you don't get enough hours and you can't make ends meet. And so many of you are experiencing the trial of just lacking You need something you don't have and you don't have the resources to get what you need to be able to survive. And so you are coming to God saying, I I don't know how I can even get through this next month, this next week, this next day. Some of you have trials of addiction. You just cannot shake that thing that holds you in bondage. Some of you have trials in, in your health. Many of you are battling cancer. Some of you have just recently found out that you have a battle of cancer ahead of you. Some of you have an incurable disease that there's, there's nothing the doctors can do. Some of you have something that cannot be diagnosed and, and you're suffering, but the doctors have no idea what to do about it because they don't know what it is. Some of you are battling chronic illnesses. Some of you are battling trials of the mind, depression, anxiety, stress, mental illness. Some of you are battling trials of abuse. And I could go on and on and on. We are a people that suffers. It's what it means to live in a broken world. And so my question to you is what James says in this passage, are you finding joy in the midst of suffering? Are you embracing endurance? Are you fighting against the, this trial, this suffering, or are you welcoming it, saying, you know what, I've got something I need to learn. God has something he wants to teach me. There's something that I need to change in my life, and, and God is using this to grow me, to mature me, to complete me, to finish me. Are you embracing what you're facing? Are you seeking wisdom? Are you trying to gut it out in your own strength and your own wisdom? Are you celebrating humility? Celebrating the fact that this this is bringing you down to to the lowest point so that God can be the one to lift you up. Are you finding joy in the midst of suffering? Are you embracing endurance, seeking wisdom, celebrating humility? I'm going to invite the worship team up and the ushers forward as I pray for us. God, we come before you as, as people who are broken in a broken world. God, we are facing things that, that we were never designed to face, but things that you were using in our lives to mold us, to shape us, to, 
to finish us, to be more and more like Jesus. God, we pray for wisdom, and we trust that you will give us guidance through these things, that you will show us how to navigate these difficult situations. And God, we ask that we are able in our humble state to, to see how you're lifting us up. That we would not see humility as a, as a bad thing, but as something that you are bringing a blessing in our lives for our good, because you are good. And God, I pray that each of us would be able to have joy in the midst of whatever, is, whatever it is that we're going through. And that you give us the power to live this out as faithful followers of you. And as we have joy, I pray that a watching world would be drawn to you because they want the hope that you offer, the hope that they see in us. And God, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.